Welcome to episode 282 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Liam O'Machane, who just did a film called Lost and Found, which is an art house comedy drama. He had a very interesting approach to shooting this film. The film has several interconnected stories, so he shot each story on its own and then edited them together into one cohesive feature film. This took place over the course of many, many months, so it's another great example of someone getting creative on how to shoot a film on the budget they have and just getting out there making things happen for themselves at whatever level they can do it. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast and then just look for episode number 282. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. A quick few words about what I'm working on. I'm trying to get my next project going. It's a horror thriller. I've been talking about it on the podcast for the last few months. Last week I had a meeting with the other two producers and we started to actually put some pieces in place. We have a budget so that's a good first step and now we've got to start building the team and finish with the fundraising. One of the producers had a friend who was also an actor and he actually that actor actually owns a house in the San Fernando Valley which is where we're going to shoot this and that house is actually a perfect location for one of our main locations in this movie so these are just the kinds of things that come up during these production meetings and we actually just he called his buddy up and we went over there took a look at the house and at least um, you know with, with first pass it seemed like um, this particular actor was interested in letting us shoot there um, assuming he could have a role in the film and, and be a part of it so that's a good first step but those are kinds of things that I've got to just get in place and then on the fundraising part we have about two-thirds of the money in place so I'm thinking I'll probably do another Kickstarter campaign to raise that last one third of the budget. So I've got to start planning that and get that worked out. Kickstarter campaign, if you've listened to this podcast for a while, you know I did one for the pinch and it's a lot of work. So I've got to really think that through and plan that out. I'm also thinking on this one, I'm going to try and at least get some of the cast in place. As I said, some of the other pieces I will try and get in place as well, just to make the package a little fuller when I go to Kickstarter. I'm hoping that will just make it seem a little bit more legitimate. Obviously, I've done a Kickstarter before and I was able to successfully get that film finished so that's hopefully um, that hopefully you know just adds to the package that I'm putting up on Kickstarter I'm not a, a first timer on Kickstarter so hopefully that will add something but um, but I just want to have a bunch of the pieces in place it'll make the pre-production a little bit easier having those people in place and hopefully it'll help the Kickstarter you know the more people I can bring on to the team before the Kickstarter the more chance um, there is of them spreading it to their contacts and to the people that they know um, so I just, just think it potentially could give me the chance of raising a little bit more money for this film and we have some stretch goals that we're thinking about too basically the bu the, the budget is going to be about seventy five thousand dollars on this and then we're hoping that's going to be sort of the production budget without any name cast but we're hoping we can get to like a hundred thousand which would give us twenty or twenty five thousand dollars just to put into some name cast and you'd really be amazed you can get some people that you've heard of you know some reputable actors um, that have you know pretty good resumes um, you know for that kind of a budgeted film um, just depending on where they are they are in their career and you know what they think of the script and what they think of the package and that stuff um, so potentially that's what we're going to try and do get to the 75k that will give us enough money to go out and shoot this movie and then if we can do um, do more than that then it would give us some money to put towards cast as well so um, that's where I am on that project um, as I said the next main thing is 
putting some of those pieces in place and then planning out the Kickstarter. I'll certainly have more details as that um, that develops. On the feature film, The Pinch, the crime thriller, which I finished last year, the sales are starting to really slow down through the various VOD platforms that we are on. 90% of the money from VOD has come from Amazon Prime, so keep that in mind as if you're thinking about um, you know putting your own movie up on these VOD platforms. And I think I've kind of run my course on Amazon Prime as the money was flowing in at a pretty nice clip for the first few months and then I would say six or eight weeks ago it really started to slow down. It seems like a lot of the success with Amazon is having them recommend your film to other people as they search through Amazon Prime and now that it's a few months old it seems like they're not doing that as much so maybe when something is new they kind of give you a little boost to see what kind of feedback and see what kind of interest the film generates and then they slowly back off it. Um, so what I'm thinking maybe I can do like a little bit of a relaunch here. So if you want to do me a favor if you listen to this podcast you get some value out of it and want to kind of help me out go to Amazon Prime and also if you do Amazon Prime if you do Amazon Prime just go there watch the movie and write an honest review of it um, it's all included with your Amazon Prime membership so if you do Amazon Prime it doesn't cost you anything extra to watch the pinch I'm hoping that maybe with some renewed interest if I can get a bunch of new people watching it get a bunch of new reviews hopefully those reviews will be good I'm just seeing if I can re um, relaunch it and kind of jump start it and get it back into that Amazon algorithm where it's getting recommended. Um, I'm going to do a few other things behind the scenes. I'll definitely do some tweets and some Facebook posts about this, get some of my friends to go. But um, definitely, if you listen to this podcast and you've been thinking, gee, I should check that um, check that film out, please do. Just go to Amazon Prime, give the film a watch, and, and write a review. Um, and then I'll certainly repost the results if this thing, whether it relaunches, if I can get a bunch of reviews and it doesn't kind of relaunch it in the Amazon algorithm, I'll, I'm happy to report that um, as well. I'm sure that would be helpful to other filmmakers. So please, if you have a minute and um, you use Amazon, please do go watch the film and write a review. It is greatly appreciated. We're available on several VOD platforms, including iTunes, Google Play, and of course, um, Amazon Prime. Um, and that should be available in the USA, Canada, and the UK. Also, I'm selling the film, The Pinch, directly from my website. So if you want to just buy it directly from me, that's always appreciated because then there's no cut. Amazon and these other um, sort of middlemen don't take any of the cut. So it's it's um, it's great if you just want to buy it directly from me. All you have to do is you just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash The Pinch. It's all lowercase, sellingyourscreenplay.com slash The Pinch. I will link to that in the show notes. And if you buy it from me, you can also buy the three-hour webinar which I did called The Making of the Pinch. I cover every part of the process of making this film, writing the screenplay, raising the money, pre-production, production, production, and of course, post-production. I put quite a bit of time in preparing for this webinar. So if you're thinking about making a micro-budget film, I think this webinar would be very educational for you. Again, that's um, sellingyourscreenplay.com slash the pinch. Anyway, that's what I'm working on. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Liam O'Machane. Here is the interview. Welcome, Liam, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you so much for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Um, I am from Galway in the west of Ireland um, in a small little um, small little village, small area, um, uh, Gaeltacht, which is an Irish-speaking community. And I grew up speaking Irish, and there was no theatre, there was no um, cinema, there was, there was nothing really. There was like a, a local community centre, and that was it, where we put on plays and different stuff like that. So I was so far removed from the entertainment industry or any industry for that matter, <laughs> except for seeing stuff on TV, you know, mm-hmm. like in our one channel, black and white TV um, for the first, you know, couple of years of my life. And then we got a second channel and then a colored TV and we thought we were fantastic, mm-hmm. you know. Sure. Um, I studied theater at first um, in 1991. I went and I studied theater in Galway and then I studied theater in, in Dublin with the Gage School of Acting. Well, Galway was with Galway Youth Theater then Gaty School of Acting, then the National Youth Theatre. And from that, I kind of put on, wrote plays and put on plays and then got involved in radio, uh, writing stuff for radio and producing radio shows. And then a lot of t- we got a new TV channel in Ireland in Gaelic called TG Cahar, t- uh, TG4, which is what it's called now. And that came in the mid to late 90s. And I, I 
used to produce a lot of TV segments and TV shows for them, usually uh, about movies, and, uh, and, and I'd go to film festivals around the world, and it would be me on my own with the camera hmm. and a microphone, and I'd have to come back with either a 10-minute segment or a full half hour, uh-huh. and that was fantastic training. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about um, you're you're doing these te- um, TV segments and that, as you say, fantastic tra- training just to learn how to edit and cut and shoot and that kind of stuff. Wh- when did you start to actually turn this into a career as an actor, as a writer, and a director? Well, while I was doing that, I was also you know producing radio shows as well. I've been involved in radio for twenty something years, you know, to to try and make some money. And at the same time, I was you know, getting parts in short movies and TV sketch shows and, and, and feature films as an actor. and But, you know, as an actor, you're always waiting for work, so mm-hmm. you kind of want to create stuff yourself. I had written a short movie in 95, 96 that got made and was like a half-hour short, and I learned from that that even in shorts, there are certain rules, and the shorter the short, the better. So if you have something that's... Uh, my short was called Fortune. It was 25 minutes. And I found out after it was made that it was too long, you know, mm-hmm. that people want something preferably under 15 minutes or under 10 minutes. Now, at the same time, it still went to loads of film festivals around the world and won awards. But for TV, for getting it on TV, it just it didn't get on. Only in Ireland and the UK did it go on TV. It didn't go elsewhere because, it was, as I said, it was too long. Mm-hmm. So after that, I, made a, uh, I wrote a feature film called The Book That Wrote Itself. And I was shopping around trying to find a director in Ireland to, to make the film. And like I asked, uh, you know, people like Kirsten Sheridan, who's made, made Disco Pigs um, and uh, who's made loads of other movies to do it. And she and other people all said to me, going, you know the script really well. You know exactly what you want. You're telling us which shots, which you don't normally do to a director. Say, mm-hmm. well, this is the shots that I think should be in it. She so said, you really need to do this. So that, by accident, I became a, a, a film director, um, you know, and, but I would, I would kind of describe myself as a filmmaker, because mm-hmm. a filmmaker is somebody who's there from the beginning to the end, and there may be many different jobs that you do. I don't sure. know if that's too long of an answer No, no, for you, no, actually. that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so how did you ultimately raise the money for that first feature? Um, you're pitching the script and, and trying to get a director. How did you actually get in a position to direct that? Um, well, basically, I decided it was going to be done quite low budget. In the UK, there was a really fantastic um, by Chris Jones and Guinevere Jolliffe, I think is their, was their names. And they did a, a book called The Guerrilla Filmmaker's Handbook. And that was a, an excellent tool. Mm-hmm. And this is before everything was, you could find stuff on the internet. Sure. And in that book was a big, massive book with a CD-ROM on it. And, uh, and it just like told you every aspect of filmmaking. So let's dig into your latest film, Lost and Found. Maybe to start out, you can give us a quick logline or pitch for that film. Um, Lost and Found is seven interconnected stories set in and around a Lost and Found office of an Irish train station. All the stories are inspired by true stories. And um, the first story is set in the Lost and Found office of this train station over one day. And all the people who come in are the main characters of the other stories. And then characters jump in and out of each other's stories. Sometimes somebody, a character is a main character in one, a support in another, and maybe talked about in something else. So mm. it's, it's people and items, and it's all, all of the stories, all the segments have a, a theme of something lost or found. I got gotcha. you. And so where did this story come from? Um, what's sort of the genesis of this? Um, well, basically, I had my second feature film, which was which was done in two thousand and seven, and and went to lots of film festivals and stuff with it from oh seven to oh nine, and it was released in lots of different places. I wanted to take a break after that because like features can take so much out of you, and it it takes so much time. I take two to three years to make the film and getting it out and stuff, and I just needed a break from that. So I went and I made a short movie called Cobbett, um, which uh, is. Uh, based on one of the, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's husband or wife. And I did that. And we shot it for two days, and it was a 10-minute short. And it was just a really amazing experience to be able to go and do something in that sort of short amount of time and have, you know, a full film and a full story and its own sort of, you know, sort of um, uh, story and stuff. And I just really liked it, and I just thought people make shorts and then they they put them out there and then they're gone and you never hear about them again and when you make a feature 
you spend so much time doing it that you know you kind of get tired of the process so i thought why not mix the two together you know and also i've been inspired by movies like shortcuts and parish at them and lots of other different portman two uh, anthology films so i thought i will put the two together and i will make these like short movies like segments and i'll do them over x amount of years also it'd be the i can work on the scripts you know, um, year by year, and I also will be able to put money on the screen uh, much better by doing it over that sort of period of time. Because if I had to do it in one go, I wouldn't mm-hmm. have had the same money or time to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, how long did it take you to shoot to shoot this project? Um, we were shooting for three to four days every year for five years, and normally wow. we would do it on the the May bank May or June bank holiday weekend. Because a lot of the heads of department, like the DP, the uh, production designer, and the uh, the costume designer, and the sound people, and all the you know the main crew, they were working on major TV shows in Ireland, like Penny mm-hmm. Dreadful, like uh, Vikings, and lots of big shows like that. So they would get the weekend off, the bank holiday weekend off. So I always, and I wanted good weather or ability of good weather to be able to do it so that's why i always pick that and everybody knew they were coming back pretty much that same weekend every year so did you did you know like you wrote that into the story are these people getting older in age or you just wrote like this these actors basically shoot one complete story in that three or four day period and then the next year you do a, a totally different story that yes yes some of them yes i mean the the stories like the the train station one at the ticket somewhere with the guy begging and also the the will the story of the will in the funeral home they were filmed together because one person's the main character in one and then he's the support in the other one and then the girl is the main in one and supporting the other so uh, it made sense to do them together and also i wouldn't be worried about trying to get the same actors to come back so and then the same with the the proposal and the wedding i did those together as well and they were done in in, in two so most of those stories took two days to shoot and then the grand opening one the bar one was a three and a half day and that was done on its own because we needed to change the outside of the pub every single day um and and we couldn't do that in the two days because you needed different looks and it would take time to do it so that one was done on one on its own as was the lost and found story the the first story that you see but that one was filmed last so that we would know which characters, uh, or I knew which characters I wanted to bring back and which maybe loose ends that I may have to tie up as well. So most of the time, it was one to two, depending on, on, on the story that we needed to tell and how long it would take. Yeah, yeah, because that would be one of my big worries is especially not so much with the crew, but with the with the talent, just that someone goes off and, you know, has a baby and and isn't acting anymore and you never hear from them again. Um, you know, you might get backed into a corner. I know, because on my pr- the previous feature I did, which was called WC, which is set, it was set in the late, uh, it set in the toilets of a late night jazz bar, and mm-hmm. I decided to come back six months later, and one of the actors, I said, oh, you know, you know, I'm going to shoot in in the jazz bar itself. I'm gonna, I, I felt I needed to get out of the toilets. We needed to show other stuff so you could cut away, and I asked, you know, a lot of the actors to come back like six months later, and mm-hmm. and, and they all came back. But one guy, I said to him, um, you know, do you look the same? He said, yeah, 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 I look the same. <laughs> and then the next day, I seen him on a TV show being interviewed, and he'd gone from having long hair to having no hair. And I rang him and said, you don't look the same. He said, ah, I'm sure, I kind of do. I said, no, you don't. You don't have any hair. <laughs> you know, so that can happen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's talk about your writing process a little bit. Um, just where do you typically write and when do you typically write? Um, well, I mean, like I think most writers and people who write scripts, there's no one way or one rule. And you know what I mean? What I do is probably not quite the same as what other people would do. I procrastinate a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I do everything but turn the computer on. I'll do things I really don't want to do just so I don't turn the computer on. But once I turn the computer on and I'll say, oh, you know what, I'll sit and I'll write for half an hour, I may end up sitting for five hours. And mm-hmm. then I feel fantastic afterwards. I feel like it's like therapy. Um, I write a treatment first, uh, like quite a detailed treatment, and then um, I'll break that down and, and then I'll send myself, in today's age with technology, I'll send myself text you know, of dialogue or notes or different stuff. I write on pieces of paper and then I'll correlate all of those together and then sit down and actually write the the script. But on this type of thing, I was doing them maybe one to two stories each year. 
so it kind of it wasn't as daunting knowing that you didn't have to have a hundred pages or whatever in one go. I needed to have twelve to fifteen pages, and that was you know I gave myself a month to six weeks to work on on those, and it was a really lovely lovely process and and a, and a really nice time. Yeah, yeah. What does your development process look like when you have a rough draft? Do you have some trusted friends that you send it to and get notes, and then do rewriting based on those notes? Um, how do you develop these projects? Um, well, on most scripts, yeah, I would, on, on the feature film ones, I would write a draft. I'd write a couple of drafts, I'd show it to people, and then a lot of the times I would hire a script editor to work with me on the script, and then, like, the first notes will come in, and the usual is like, no, I'm not changing anything, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, and then you kind of calm down and sit and read the notes again, okay, fine, yeah, maybe I agree with that, maybe I don't agree with this, and then you take some time out and do another draft and send it back and back and forth until you're both pretty happy with it. But I think it's very important, if you are working with a script editor, to work with, with a script editor who is um, who's the right person and the right genre for for the script that you're doing, you know, because mm -hmm. I think if you got somebody that was didn't really have an idea of the type of material that you're writing, um, you're at a loss. Uh, but yeah. for this type of project, I mean, I would have written the script and gave it to some people who work on the film to look at. They would give me notes or tell me what they thought about it. But you're, you know, these stories are sort of one sort of uh, there's one plot. There's no mm -hmm. subplots, in, really, as such in it. So it it was a different process to writing a, a straight feature film. Yeah, yeah. And I was going to ask about that. How do you approach screenplay structure and something like that? Um, do you know ultimately you're going to be editing these things together, interweaving them, or is it one story and then one story? Um, I just did them one story at a time, and then, and then when I was about to shoot them, then I would decide, I knew who the main characters were, and then I would decide which people or which characters or which actors I was going to take from other stories to play the other parts in it and go, well, they could be this or they could be that, or we don't know what job they have, so let's give them this job, and maybe that will make you think about them in a different way. So it was kind of it very much, everything was done really at the same time, from writing it to casting it to doing all that kind of stuff. And then sometimes, you know, in, when a segment was finished, I might have an actor who would have just had one line or maybe not even a line and just an expression or a look and, and that kind of set me off on maybe a, a, one, a, a, something within one of the other stories ago, well that person could be the main character in this one instead of the other, of, or maybe whoever I was thinking of, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, sure, sure. What advice do you have for screenwriters that are looking to break into the business? I think write, <laughs> which is what people always say, write, write, write. Keep mm -hmm. writing. Don't be afraid to write. I mean, I've known a lot of writers who, who've written stuff and they've never shown it to anybody and they call themselves writers and they never send it out and I think they're just afraid of what people will say. I think don't be afraid to write, but also don't be afraid to show it to people and, uh, and, you know, and, and expect the unexpected. You know, maybe it'll be fantastic, maybe it won't, but mm -hmm. you won't know unless you keep writing and keep at it. Yeah, also, yes. write about what you know, which is what everybody says as well, and it's so true. Write about what you know, or try to write about what you know. Yeah, yeah, sound advice. What have you seen recently that you thought was really great? Anything at the movies or on Netflix or anything that... Um, oh, let me like? see. Um, um, could you ever forgive me? I just thought it was really fantastic. And the reason I loved it so much is because um, I just, I'm a big fan of Richard E. Grant, and I love Whitnell and I, which was a movie he was in in the mid-'80s. And in, in a way, it felt like that it was a continuation of his character from that other movie th over 30 years ago. And I don't know if you've ever seen Whitney and I. It's a, it's no. a cult classic. Huh. It's just, it's okay. really, you should, you should watch it. The script is fantastic. It's Bruce, I think it's Bruce Robinson who, who wrote and directed it, who um, I think he was nominated for an Oscar for, um, oh, for the movie about Cambodia in, in, um, oh, in the late 70s. Oh, yes, no. he wrote oh. that, and okay. um, and I think he was nominated for that, and then he got to make this other movie himself. So, okay. could you ever forgive me? I really liked it. I, I, I do like Melissa McCarthy. It seems really, really funny, and I think as well that a lot of um, a lot of comedians are exceptional straight actors because mm -hmm. they have so much, they, they, the, the need to be funny, and they have so much energy that when you trap that by not allowing them to be funny, you get this intensity. That, uh, that comes across that you may not get from other people. Now, that's not always, not yeah. every comedian can, can act, but a lot of them can. I love sure. that 
uh, movie. And uh, I mean, there's so many movies I see, and I can't think of any else yeah, on the top yeah. of my head. No, those are, but, yeah, those are Vice, great. Okay, yeah. Vice was Sorry good, but it's it, it but we've got just about a minute and a half remaining. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, I thought Vice was good as well, but it, it depressed me. That's just the yeah. message just really depressed me. Um, but yeah, I mean, and Spotlight last year, I just thought was an extraordinary film uh, and, and a big short. I'm going back a year because uh, I can't think of what, what I've mm-hmm. seen recently. I haven't yeah, seen yeah. too many things. Yeah, no, those are great recommendations. How can people see Lost and Found? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? Yes, Lost and Found is out now in Boston, San Francisco, and uh, Prince Edward Island in Canada. And it did so well over the weekend in Boston that it's being held over for another week. And then this week, uh, March 29th, it's opening in uh, New York City. Uh, in Kew Garden Cinemas, it's in uh, New York, in, in Albany, New York, Toronto, Edmonton, and Calgary, and then on the 12th of April, it's in Chicago and Washington, and then the 19th, it's in Los Angeles and Long Beach. Perfect, perfect. And what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing? I'll round yeah, up. Yeah, on I'm on I'm on Twitter. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to find my my handle, um, but let me see here and my um, Lost and Found. Um, page is uh, my lost and found one. Let me just bring it up here. It's uh, um, the film lost and found. So with a big T, a big F, a big L, and a big F, the film lost and found. Um, but also, if you type in to Google or whatever, lost and found Irish film, it's the only Irish movie that will that will come up. But you know, there's a lot of movies called Lost and Found. I only realized that after I'd made the film. There's so many other movies <laughs> gotcha. with that same title, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, Liam, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with me today. Good luck with this film and good luck with your um, future projects. Brilliant. Thank you, Ashley, so much. And thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high-quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three-pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis. So it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly Best of Newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Justin Kelly and Savannah Knopp. They just co-wrote a semi-autobiographical film called J.T. Leroy, which Savannah actually lived in. She lived this life and then wrote a book about her experience. So it's a great example of just two people coming together. She wrote this book. He was a filmmaker coming together, collaborating, and getting this film out there. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.